Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and I get to have a radio show. I've always wanted to have a radio show, even since college. And, and the Holy Spirit's so good to plant new and right desires in our hearts and guide us and lead us by the gifts and uh, that he's given us and because i have a radio show i get to talk with people that would never ever talk to me <laughs> if i didn't have one and today we have a great guest with us we'll get a little bit more into his background when we come back but his name is eric sammons and we're going to be talking about the jesse tree the his, the ancestry of jesus we'll be right back with more of the bear wozniak adventure welcome to the bear wozniak adventure Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, in Hawaii, uh, the Polynesian tattoo is so beautiful. In fact, one of my friends uh, who did my tattoos also did the rocks tattoos. He's one of the, the great uh, tattoo artists of, Pol of Pol all of Polynesia. He's from the uh, island of Mo'orea in, in, uh, in the Tahitian chain. He's a great fire dancer. He's a great <clears throat> musician. But there's differences between the different islands and the nature of the tattoo. In Hawaii, the tattoo is... Uh, a series of triangles and when you see those on their leg or on their arms uh, it's you 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 ask them tell me about your lineage tell me about your ancestry because every one of those triangles that may take the full length of their 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 thigh is going back into history you know I have a friend of mine Dallas Carter who, who's he's I think he's fifth or sixth or seventh removed from the grand orator in chief uh, Noehe who, uh, who was King Kamehameha's orator and so there's the, the now that he knows that, and it's right on, you know, people know this is my ancestor, this is my ancestor, this is who my ancestor is. It's tattooed right on them. And so the, the significance of lineage is tattooed right into the Gospels, the lineage of Jesus. And it's so, it's so interesting when you read the Bible, you get rolling, okay, I'm going to read, I'm going to read the whole Bible. And pretty soon you get to this section that says, and so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. But it's not there. It's not boring. It's there for a reason. Our history is so important, and in these days, people want to rewrite history, which is also very, very dangerous, uh, because that, that history, the truth of our history, links us to, to our own heritage. And what can be more significant than to look into the ancestry, the very lineage of the Son of God, the, uh, Jesus Christ, his human, his human ancestry? So we have Eric Sammons with us, and I'm going to put my glasses on because... I'm not going to read everything here, but the coolest thing is he's, uh, he's uh, the editor for Crisis Magazine. You know why they name it that is, like, every magazine has a deadline, and so every magazine is always running under a crisis. <laughs> and they probably <laughs> said, well, what should we call our magazine? I don't know. Well, hurry up. But we gotta, we got to know. There, it's going to be a crisis if we don't know. And so some, some uh, editorial junior editor thought that was the name they wanted to give it. And there you have Crisis Magazine. But what, a, what an amazing thing to be the, an uh, editor and author for Crisis Magazine. And his beliefs are life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness, which is to say happiness. You know, holiness and happiness, they're one and the same. When Jesus said the Beatitudes, uh, he was speaking of happiness. You know, happy are you when? When you, when you live a life of holiness. So he's written several books on Catholic evangelization. He's totally explained Bitcoin, so no one could ever be confused by what Bitcoin is. <laughs> and uh, and the, the and the, the the most recent book, of course, is uh, on the ancestry of Jesus. So, Eric Salmons, known to most of his friends as the Bar Brawler. <laughs> You're going to bring that on. You're going to bring that right at the beginning. Yeah. So well, I've been the... I've been I've been kicked into bars. Uh, Hell's Angels one time kicked me into a bar because they wanted me to drink. <laughs> but I've never been been in a bar brawl or kicked out. So what what is this? Uh, let's go ahead and get right to the chase. Yeah, well, if people know me, people who know me, it is a very, uh, it's very much against my image. I'll put it that way. People would not believe that I've actually been in a bar brawl before. It's like Clark Kent, right? It's like you're a Clark Kent then, you're saying. Yeah, I'm Clark Kent who never becomes Superman. And uh, so, yeah, because, you know, I was, I was a good kid growing up. I had a few things I did I probably shouldn't have done like we all do. But Speak like for college, yourself. Speak for yourself. Yeah. yeah. But in college... I was uh, 
I was practicing cat. I mean, I was a Protestant practicing Protestant converted to Catholicism in college. Wow. So doing the things that you're supposed to do and, and everything. But then one actually it was one Thanksgiving. Uh, I think it was my, yeah, my senior year. So I was coming in the church soon. I was, I was a catechumen at the time, went home for Thanksgiving and a couple of my high school friends decided, Hey, let's go out on the Friday night or something like that. So we went out and Let's just say our lives had diverged since high school, how we lived. But I was like, okay, they're friends of mine. I'll That's go what happens. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, I was a designated driver, basically. And uh, I went, and we went to this bar, hanging out. Well, one of my friends, let's just say he's a bit more uh, rambunctious than I am. He got in an argument with somebody, and he's a type will not back down no matter what. Uh, still, still keep both of them to this day. Good guy. Uh, but he basically just kept on egging on this guy. And so sure enough, fists start getting thrown and I'm just standing there like, well, I can't just stand here. My buddy what, what was the argument about the climate. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just you know, kidding. Cause that's, what's going to be happening. This Thanksgiving to Christmas, people will right. be brawling that's over right. whether climate uh, change is a real issue. Okay. So I'm sorry. I interrupt you. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I don't even remember now. Of course, what it was, it's something stupid. I'm sure. And so I just was like, well, I, I got to defend my friend. I can't just stand here. So I jump in, and at one point, my glasses get knocked off, and, and I'm trying to keep people away from each other mostly, but it gets kind of crazy. And I don't even remember the details, but somehow we get thrown out. We're, we're out of the bar. and It's always the second fight that's the bad one, <laughs> right? So, yeah, and so like I'm, my, my, my friend is hot. He wants to keep it going. But basically, uh, me and another one of my friends, we, we pull him away, and, and we, we, get, we get going. And I didn't realize what's going on, but at some point I realized I taste some blood. And I had, I think it was from my glasses getting yanked. I don't even know what, but I had a scrape, like a scar on my forehead. It's like Harry Potter or something. And, and it's, it's bleeding. And I didn't even feel it at the time. It didn't really hurt that much, but you know, your head bleeds pretty quickly. Yeah. And so it's bleeding. So I get patched up something. And so like I get home and my parents are like, what happened? I'm like, nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I mean, I don't even think they believe me. And the best, the best part of the story, though, is I get back to school, and people, of course, obviously see the scar, and they're like, what happened? And I just very plainly just say, oh, I got in a bar fight. And, of course, nobody believes Yes. Me. See, that's the thing when you're subtle like that, and you that's deny right. it, they believe yeah. you even more, right? They, they... That's right. I just was like, I got in a bar fight, just real casual, and like, they just thought, oh, he doesn't want to tell us what really happened. And yeah, because he's, so he's, he's, he's so bad. He's so bad. He's yeah. Well, the funny thing is, they just thought it's so. It was so inconceivable that I was a straight laced guy that somebody like me would get in a bar fight. There's just no way that would happen. And I even have a, one of my friends. I remember she just would not believe me. I mean, I, I ended up telling the whole story to her. I told her, and then she's like, "Yeah, that's nice. I'm glad you made that up, but I don't believe that actually happened." I think to this day she still doesn't believe well, did, me. Well, did you have a nice fight? <laughs> You know, exactly. Right. Like that. I hope it was a I mean, nice we one. <laughs> we didn't lose. And I, I think I was the only person who had any any uh, scars or anything from it. It went away pretty soon. That's just awesome, scrape. dude. That's awesome. You so, know, I've always said if I if there's going to be a fight, because I, 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 normally, normally when I have a drink, I usually drink a half a drink. I'm just not a big drinker. So in a bar fight, I'm always going to be the guy that wins because I'm not going to be the guy that's drunk. That's right, my right. philosophy. <laughs> but normally I'm just the guy that's sane enough to walk away before. It's worse. Well, and that's that's always my philosophy. Walk away. And of course, I wasn't drinking that night. Like I said, I was the driver, and uh, so I think I had probably more sense than anybody else there at the time. But yeah, it was it was funny. I just it, it's just so against my image that I just it's it just a funny well, we've story just ruined we've now. ruined your career now. So yeah, that's so right, exactly. it, but but did you hang? I'm out the former with, editor of Crisis Magazine now. <laughs> as of this moment, <laughs> did you ever uh, go to a bar with them again? No. Okay. No, see, that was senior year. And yeah. like then after that, they kind of knew when they would come home to visit, or I'd go home visit or something like that. They kind of knew I wasn't really interested in that. You, you anyway, stopped. You I, stopped getting invited. Yeah, I did. That's yeah, really cool. Then, when I did something else with them, you know, maybe I do something else with them, but they never. When they went to bars, they just didn't ask you, me anymore. You know, I, yeah. I try to be a good friend, but it's like I just they knew I wasn't interested. There's in that a scene. divergent. You know, I remember when I was in high school, I had this epiphany when I was a end of my junior year that one day I could be a father that I could be a dad that I could have children and from that moment my my focus was study hard get into good college get a good job so I could afford my take care of my kids and so what would happen is I would be invited I would I was 
kid from California moved to Texas, I'd be invited to go to those drinking parties or whatever kind of parties, and I would just say no. And then gradually, I just didn't get invited. But right. there's, a real, there's, a real, there's a real benefit to that. There's that, the psalm that says, don't sit around w- with scoffers. You know, choose your friends wisely. And so it's just not like you're rejecting them. It's just like, no, I don't want to go. I, don't, I know it's good. there's going to be drinking. There's going to be yeah. you know, weed, whatever. I just don't need to be there. And gradually, just by s- saying no to parties, there's, there's that divergence. You're always going to be a friend to them. But, but isn't it interesting as you, as you go on in life, your friends change. Friends that were, were friends, you, you kind of grow out of some of them. And you need to. It's kind of like my friend Gerard Middleton. He was a pastor for University of Miami national champion basketball team. And he talks about uh, certain people just not being on his championship diet. They're not on my right. diet. They're, we're talking with Eric Sammons. When we get back, we talk more about his bar fighting career, his MMA history. And no, we're going to actually talk about the ancestry of Jesus. Uh, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bears Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion. Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, we want to invite you guys uh, to go to our website, deepadventure.com. And uh, women, you can go there too. Uh, and and, and uh, you can get a, a, a gift to your husband or to your, the, your brother or brother-in-law or son uh, to Bear School of Manliness at deepadventure.com. We have a three-year curriculum with audio and video and written and, and, and assessments and places to set goals. And, and so men can go through this three-year curriculum, but we do it together. And fathers can do it with their sons. They have their own logins. For the men that are over 18, they're part of our man cave. We have Zoom video meetups about once or twice a month. And we all go through the same area of that of the school of manliness together so we all go through it if you if you join a year and a half in you just join up right where we are uh, some of the topics are are on the virtues uh, some one of our i think the topic coming up next is how a man needs to be dangerous there's a, there's a certain line that men need to be able to draw on their draw in their life and they need need to be prepared at times to be dangerous so go to deepadventure.com and consider joining bear school of manliness speaking of dangerous uh the, the most dangerous person i know of is jesus christ uh, he's a real danger. He came into this world basically to uh, take on the biggest bully on the block. He was known to take out a whip for every now and then. And Eric Sammons is with us. He's written a book on the ancestry of Jesus. And so, Eric, welcome, welcome to the show. And uh, what inspired you to get to, to dig in deeper into, into Christ's ancestry? 
Well, this, this is, book is a little different than my other books I've written in the sense that most books I write, I have an idea, I pitch it to a publisher, and then if they say yes, I got a book to write. This one really came out of the, the life of our family. Uh, mm. I grew up Protestant. I converted Catholicism a couple years before I got married. And our first advent together, my, my wife and I, my wife, by the way, is a co-author of this book. So it's both That's right. my wife, Suzanne. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so our first advent together, my wife was like, well, I guess we're going to do the Jesse tree. And I was like, what's that? Never heard of it. And a lot of cradle Catholics, even cradle Catholics haven't heard of it. But as a Protestant, I definitely never heard of it. And basically what it is, it's a devotion. It includes ornaments. It includes a tree. And you do it during Advent. Each day you look into a figure from Jesus' ancestry. It comes from the Jesse, the father of David. And so it's the Jesse tree, it's the family tree of Jesus. And it was amazing doing it each year because each year we read the same scripture passages each day for each day and, and same figures, but you get something new each time. And one of the things I started to realize over the years was the sacred scripture says that Jesus is like us in all things but sin. But I would say there's another way he's not like us and that he got to choose his own family. We're stuck with our family. I mean, it might be great. Might not be so good. Well, maybe they feel the same family. way about you, though. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 by the way, I am the crazy uncle at Thanksgiving. So, I mean, th th that's okay. But, but the idea is, you know, our families are families. And families are, have their the highs and the lows. You got some scoundrels and some saints in them. Every family does. And so mm. does Jesus. But he chose the family he was going to be in. And so what better way to get to know him than to really look into his family. And yeah, uh, yeah. I wrote a book years ago, probably about a dozen years ago now, that was about the Gospel of Matthew. And that's how the Gospel of Matthew starts, with the genealogy of Jesus. It's the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament. So clearly, this is something God is telling us, I want you to know about my son's family, his yes. human family, and what, where, where he comes from. Yes. And, and I think that's, that really set off a, a light for me that I thought, okay. And so our family, we would do the Jesse tree each year. Now, the book we used, I bought a book our first year of marriage. It was like from the 1970s, I think, and it was awful. It, it gave the scripture passages and the figures for each day. So I was like, okay, good. But the reflections were just your 1970s kind of flaky, weird stuff. And so I would just skip the reflection and make up my own, or my wife would make up her own. And we did that for years, and we have seven kids, ages 25 down to seven. And so each year it's a little different on the demographics of our family, who's, who's home for, we have four now or out of the house. And so it's just something we did each year, and other families started finding out about it, and so we wrote some notes up. We, we printed it out in Microsoft Word and gave it to some of our friends, and we kept doing that. Wow. And finally, like, you know, let's, let's, I think this is something a lot of people would really get a benefit from so we end up writing uh, the book about it but really it all comes back to really diving into how god prepared the world yes. for the coming of his yes time. yes i mean it just it, it it's really when you think about it okay so i like to talk about i like to mention that there's this meme on the internet of the crazy conspiracy theorist who's kind of like great looking like crazy and then behind him all these connections with string connecting all yeah these that's things. that's the old testament <laughs> That's right. Exactly. And not only God's Old Testament, but but to but, save us. but the the preparation uh, uh, of Socrates and the, the ability to think and to have reason and the Roman yeah. roads and all that stuff, it was a big conspiracy. Yeah, I mean, and bring Paul Jesus. tells us that in the fullness of time, yes, Christ came. Well, the fullness of time. What is that? It's when everything finally came together. So, understanding how God put all those things together, the people He used, who were members of Jesus' family, mostly. Understanding that really, I think, brings out the meaning of Christmas. I mean, then when Christmas comes, you just can't wait. I mean, you're bursting at the seams that, okay, our Lord is coming. God did all this stuff for thousands of years, put all this stuff together, and now we can really celebrate. So all of that is to say I just I love studying the Old Testament. I love studying the family of Jesus, uh, the, the people came before him. And, and what led to well, his coming. Because yeah, but, I think you know, that helps us understand his but, coming. But, I mean, Jesus had it. I mean, you know, think about it. He had his ancestors were perfect. They all had these kind of rings <laughs> around their back of their head. There were no sinners among them. They were all perfect angels, you know. And so he had the advantage. Well, there's a, there is that one murderer. 
Yeah, right, right. Oh, oh there is that Adults horror. Were, there's the uh, harlot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, there's a few like that. There's a few bad yeah, yeah. So Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's the beauty, and that's that that's such a, a, a statement about our own families, before we get too judgy about them, <laughs> is that, look at Jesus. He, was, he had that family. I mean, I, I have to admit, probably my favorite Old Testament character is probably King David, mm. because here is, Scripture says, a man after God's own heart. Well, when we picture that, what would we think of? We'd think of the holy monk, maybe, who's in his uh, cell all day praying, fasting, all that. No, those are good things. I'm not, I, I, monks are awesome. But yet, King David, what was he? He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. I mean, he, he, he did these terrible things, yet he was still a man after God's own heart. And I think that's an example for all us men, not that hopefully we're not adulterers mm-hmm. and murderers, no, but the- if we are, God still loves us, and we can still be a man after his heart, no matter what we've done, no matter what our failings are, King David shows us that we can still love Jesus in spite of our our frailness. And this is and King David is the figure par excellence of the Old Testament. I mean, that is the guy. I mean, St. Luke in his gospel, he he has a lot of ties to the Davidic kingdom with with Jesus and everything. So the idea that there's this man who did these terrible things and he is one of the perfect examples of somebody who follows God. I mean, I think that's that's something amazing for all of us. Well, yeah. When he sinned, he he definitely knew how to repent and to grieve, right. you know, to grieve for his sins. So, um, yeah. So, so you look you look at the history of in your book. How far back do you go in the in Adam? The All the, the back first, to Adam. the first one's Adam and Eve because we want to set the stage because uh, Saint Luke in his in his gospel when he does the genealogy of Jesus, he goes back to Adam because he's trying to show how Jesus is truly man, part of the human race, all the Gentiles. Because Luke's writing Gentiles. All the Gentiles, everybody is part of this divine plan of salvation. Right. So it goes all the way back to Adam. Whereas St. Matthew goes back to Abraham because he's trying to show that he's got a Jewish Christian audience, and he's trying to show that Jesus is that Jewish Messiah that we've been waiting mm-hmm. for. Mm-hmm. So we start all the way back with Adam because that's where the story begins. Because really the Old Testament, I divide it up into two parts. The first three chapters of Genesis and everything else. <laughs> because it's really the first three chapters of Genesis sets the stage tells us it basically lays out okay what's the problem mm. and then the rest of the old testament is what's the solution mm. which leads to the actual solution which is in the gospels and mm. so that's what we got to start right there with adam to see how this all started uh so we can understand why all these figures came in the first place and what they did and then you have this this divergence right out you know there was the fall of adam and eve and then there's the the fall of a- cain and abel i mean the right. the the human race just was just in trouble yeah i mean and you get and then you get to noah and the whole world is basically god's just like okay i'm, I'm done with you people I'll, I'll keep a few and that's it I promise never to do that again but i think there's something when you read genesis i mean genesis as a movie is a rated r movie because the, the violence the i mean there's incest incest there's everything in there but that's the point of it isn't like you'd have a, today's movies they do it to try to titillate and try to attract people but Genesis is written to say, this is how bad things are when you don't follow me. This is how far you guys have fallen. Mm. You guys are, can't do anything on your own. And so that's really why Genesis has these terrible stories is because it tells us, okay, and then you start seeing with Exodus, now things start to get, okay, now we're moving in the right direction. But then, of course, what happens? <laughs> Moses goes up to the mountain. Okay, we got our epiphany with God. We're, we're with them. I'm going to get down there. We're going to straighten everything out. And of course, it's, it's all complete disaster. And so that's, and that's really, I mean, when the Old Testament story, I, the word I use when I think of the Old Testament, the word, first word comes to my mind is mercy, because God's people are continually rejecting him, continually refusing to follow him. And he just keeps saying, okay, I, I'm going to keep on lifting you up. I'm going to keep on reaching down and lifting you up no matter what you do. And I, it just, I know the Old Testament's hard. I know it's hard to understand. It's hard to, to get through. And like you said, most people, they start reading through, they get to like Leviticus or Numbers, and like, I, I'm done with this. But it really is a beautiful story. And that's one of the purposes of Jesse Tree is to give a, a practical way to understand at least the big picture of that Old Testament. Yeah, I think there's a, just a little aside, Jeff Cavins has the book, the, 
the the Great Adventure book uh, Bible, and he he helps you kind of to dodge the bullet on Le- on Leviticus and a few of those places. <laughs> so you're reading more of the historical content. Uh, the first time you go through the, the whole Bible. We're talking with Eric Sammons, and he's the author of a book, uh, The Ancestry of Jesus. We're going to get back and talk more about that. But, you know, the thing about that, that ancestry, you talked about um, mercy, the fallen man's continuing to, to, to harden his heart, to stumble and to fall, to seek false gods. But with Moses, as you said, you know, he came, comes down from the, from the mountain. Uh, but that, that tabernacle in the wilderness, in there was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the ark was the law, this this law of Moses, the, these Ten Commandments he placed there. But above that was the mercy seat. So right. so so the the truth and the justice and the goodness of God, I've heard it said once that the, the justice of God is played uh, in the key of mercy. So um, so as we fall, God is always calling us, always calling us. If we deny him, if we if we are unfaithful, yet he is always faithful. But the Bible does say if we deny him, he will deny us because he cannot deny himself. We're talking with, with Eric Sammons. We're going to come back and talk with him about uh, the early church fathers. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Mom, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak Adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, Eric. So do you have the same problem I have? We're talking with Eric Sammons. He's the author. He's the editor of Crisis Magazine, the author of The Ancestry of Jesus. You have the same collection of books I have, I see. You know, I was chuckling when I saw your books because when you have that, you have the, the, the all the church fathers, which I have on, an, on another bookshelf, and then I have the commentary as well, on, which you have. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I love the church fathers. Me too. Uh, I I remember when I was uh, I went to I, I converted Catholicism. My parents weren't real happy about it, and uh, then I went off to get a master's degree in theology at Steubenville. Oh, you I did. Real, oh, love. Yeah. I, I'm actually pursuing my online degree with them. In me, in oh yeah, and I theology. actually finished mine through the online program. I started there, but then life took its turn, yeah. so I couldn't finish there. But I finished through the online program. Yeah. It's great. It's a great program. But I was really into church fathers, and one year my parents uh, they purchased me that set you have behind you, uh, and I felt like it was a moment where they're saying, "Okay, we we, we know you're oh, Catholic now. We're not real happy about that, but we acknowledge you're still a faithful believer of Jesus Christ." Yeah. And so that was like a big deal to me wow. uh, when that happened because I was like, you know, they they they, they bought that for me. And I I was a poor college kid. I I had I couldn't afford it. Oh, and, I and know. So yeah, it was. Uh, I got it, good it was, deals it, on those. I books. remember. I think of that when I see that series. I, I that's you know who I love. First you thing know, I think who, about. Well, I, who, uh, Steve Ray. You know the book Crossing the Tiber. Oh yeah. That's how I was introduced to the early church fathers uh, and re- how I returned to the church. So I have a great love for them. But my friend Jason Jones always has a real problem with the early church fathers. You know Jason. Oh, I know Jason. I've interviewed him before. He's great. One, one of his biggest problems is that he always complains the early church fathers always plagiarize him. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it true when you're when you get really inspired and you come up with this really unique idea, and like a year later you're reading through the church fathers? Oh, they already said that. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, you hear that all the time from Scott Hahn. 
because he talks about like how he was like prize and he's looking yes, into it. He right. He's like, oh my gosh, I discovered this. And he looks like, oh, this was discovered <laughs> like 1800 years ago. Whoops. <laughs> my, you know, I, I, if people watch this, they'll see I have a little bit of a sunburn today. I was out surfing yesterday uh, with no sunblock. But, um, you know, I had this thought, you know, um, be, going, to, going to prayer or like to adoration, a lot of times you don't feel anything. It's like being out on a cloudy day in Hawaii when people think they're, they're, they can't get a sunburn because there's, they can't see the sun. But they'll come back with a bad sunburn even on a cloudy day. And how that's what it's like in prayer when you don't sense God's presence, but he's still at work. He's still changing you. He's still transforming you. I thought that was so erudite. And then I read Augustine said the exact same thing. Stole it from me completely. That's right. He stole it from me. I mean, the church fathers. I mean, you just—they're they're so great. I mean, because they really—they said they seem. It seems like they said it all. Uh, because they have these insights in the scripture. Because their worldview was so different than our worldview, and so when they look at the sacred scriptures, they don't look at it like we do. We're very scientific in how we look at the sacred scriptures. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they were not, and that's a good thing. They were faithful yeah. in how they looked at it. They were true, the, the theologian, as one of the church fathers, can't remember which one said, the true theologian is one who prays, and one who prays is a true theologian. Mm -hmm. And that's really how they looked at theology, was prayerfully going through the sacred scriptures. We look at it now where you're dissecting and, and you're, you're splitting it up, like, oh, what does this word mean, stuff like that. And there's a place for that. Well, I yeah, mean, but I, the, I, the, the Bible's yeah. supposed to dissect you, isn't it? Like, isn't the word, right. the sword, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. But there is yeah. that way in which they see, um, I don't know what the correct word is now, but I remember one point I used to say, well, there's the spirit, soul, and body. This is what I thought I made up. It's really the early church fathers. But when you read the Bible, especially like in the Old Testament, you'll see here, here, the body of it, here's the story of what happened. And then the soul level, I would say, would be, here's the practical application, the moral thing. That you could, but then there's that spiritual thing that the church, or the church fathers, where they would use it, I don't know if allegory is quite the right word, but they would use it in that sense. They would take it even one layer different, right. and one layer d deeper. But let's go back to our subject of the day, the ancestry of Jesus. Which of the other um, of his ancestors really... Uh, stand out to you in that story of the Jesse tree going all the way back to Adam. <laughs> I, I think Abraham stands out to me, particularly because he's the father of faith. Uh, St. Paul writes about him a lot because, I mean, we hear these stories so much, we don't realize how radical they are. Here's Abraham. He's a pagan. He's not a believer in the, in the one true God. He's living in the land of Ur, which is basically modern day uh, Iraq. And all of a sudden, he, he believes in multiple gods. I mean, the people around him all believe in multiple gods. All of a sudden, he gets a calling. I'm the one God. You need to follow me. You need to move your entire family. You need to go over to this other complete area you've never been to before. You need to settle down there. I mean, think about that for a moment, what that would take to, to do that. And he, he basically said, okay, well, I'm going to do that. And he, yeah. it, was more, it was more like he didn't say, well, look, I'm going to give you a map. You're going to leave here. We're going to go over there. Go to the place that I will show you. Right, right. So it's like, you know, just it's a day to day thing with me. You're going to have to walk with me. You walk on, you walk, and the camel could be on one side, I'll be on the other side, and we will go for this journey together. And, and just the faith that he's promised a son doesn't see it. And he does make a mistake in trying to, to create his own uh, fulfillment of the promise with Ishmael. But then, like with Isaac, and of course, the, the sacrifice of Isaac. That is probably the most, one of the most beautiful and terrifying stories in the Bible, because it, re and it really is hard to, for moderns particularly to understand, because, I mean, here's God tells him, go sacrifice this child of promise. The one I promise you, you're going to go kill him. And it's likely, people don't realize this, he was probably about 12 or 13. I, I yeah, he could have time. resisted. He, he knew what was going on. He could have resisted. He's carrying the wood. And... And Abraham, though, he's had these years to really become attached to him. I mean, I have a son, and I know when he was 12 or 13 years old, the, he, yeah. he meant the world to me, and yes. I had a very close relationship with him. Still right. do. But, I mean, the idea of, okay, I'm going to take this guy up to a mountain, this kid up to a mountain, and I'm going to kill him because God told me to is just insane. But he did it. But the, And the passage that people don't always remember is, is that he says he believed that God— well, this, when he, was, he believed that God could raise even the dead. And that's that beautiful part is that for Abraham, he had such faith. He's like, well, if God tells me to do this, it's going to work out. 
because God told me to do it. And most of us don't have that faith. That and and like you said, it, it's the day to day faith. He didn't know. He's like, okay, today I'm supposed to kill my son. Tomorrow well, God uh, will make it all work out somehow. And, and, and that's just that's what's gonna happen. And when the son asks, so what are we gonna sacrifice? And he says, the Lord will provide. It reminds me of like, um, you know, I'm a filmmaker, and there's most most film you want to clip it, you want to keep things moving along, you don't want the audience to get bored. But when there's a moment of suspense. You want to stretch that out and stretch that out and stretch that out and stretch that out like, you know, when you're watching a, an old-fashioned horror movie, you know, uh, the guy with that axe is coming, you know. And you see that. He's on the, he's on the altar, and, and, a, a, and Abraham is raising, you know, the, the knife. And, like, well, what, what if God tells you to stop and you don't hear it in time? You right, know, right. It's very right. suspenseful. But this is the nature of God's provision in our life. My mother used to say that God is a swashbuckler. He likes to come in like the, like the three musketeers swinging from the tapestry with his sword, or the cavalry arriving at the last minute to save the day. There are people right now in their lives that are experiencing those moments of, of suspense in their life where there doesn't seem to be an answer, where there doesn't seem to be a solution. Part of the answer is that God can change the circumstances in a, mo- in a blink of an eye. Especially if someone's facing a health issue, you know. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say the times in my life, looking back, that I was the most fearful of the future because of something going on, whatever. And I'm a I'm a control freak, and so that's always been my challenge: is that I want to have the whole future controlled for me and, and planned out and all that. It always didn't work out the way I wanted it to to make it all work out, and mm. it was better. And it was bad. And looking, but I didn't know that until later. It wasn't until maybe even years later, I look back and I'd say, you know, I really wanted it to work out like A. It actually worked out like Z, <laughs> Not which even isn't B. what I wanted. It was Z. <laughs> and yet Z it was way better in the end. Because, and, and that's really what, that's why Abraham didn't look to see all A, B, C, D, E, Z. He had learned he that wasn't lesson. Looking at that. He's just like, I'm just going to do in the moment. I'm going to do what God is telling me to do. I'm not going to have all planned out. And that's why I like Abraham, because he's very un- much unlike me. And my favorite saying is St. Francis of Assisi, because I think I know I, I'm confident if I lived in the time of St. Francis of Assisi, I would have thought he was crazy. I would have just been like this. I would have written him off. But that's actually why I love him, because I know he was a, a beautiful model of Jesus Christ, because he lived each day. He didn't plan things out. He wasn't a control freak like I am. And that's why I love him so much, because it's like, that's the type of person. My, my oldest daughter, I don't know where she came from, because she's, she's an artist type. She's very much lives day to day, stuff like that. And I just love it. And I, I tell mm-hmm. her, I said, you know, I, I, I do, as a dad, I tell her, sometimes you should be more like me. I admit that. My daughter's But then I also tell her, yeah, I, I think yeah. I need to be more like you sometimes. Yes. Well, you know, Abraham, though, at that moment on, on Moriah, which I love, is the same location of Calvary. Is uh, wasn't just this sudden moment. He had learned that as he followed Jesus day by day, lamp onto his feet, you know, as Abraham followed uh, God's will day by day, you know, it wasn't like, like I said, he didn't give a map. He go, oh man, we're we are really we are really thirsty. <laughs> oh, there's a spring, <laughs> you know, around the corner. He didn't know about. So he had learned that by following God in the small things. So so if you if you follow God in the small things, the big things kind of take care of themselves. We're talking with Eric Sammons, editor of Crisis Magazine, and also the new book, The Ancestry of Jesus, The Jesse Tree. We'll be right back with... Is that right? The, yes, how The to, Jesse Tree. That's right. The Jesse Tree. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com.
Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Baron Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, we want to invite everybody uh, to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and subscribe to our newsletter. If you get our newsletter, this is what happens. You get to have um, the radio show, which which airs on EW10 Network, actually gets delivered to you before it airs, and it's in a YouTube uh, type uh, format. We send you a YouTube type format of the radio show, along with other other things that we send you every Saturday morning before the show airs. So you get to see how sunburned I am, and you get to see our guest Eric Sammons, and uh, and uh, that he has the same books I have on his bookshelf. <laughs> people, people, you know, I was being interviewed the other day, Eric, and someone said I really like your backdrop. They thought that was like a poster, <laughs> you know, like oh. those. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so so Eric, tell us more uh, uh, about um, the, some of the other char characters we've mentioned. Abraham, we've mentioned Adam briefly. Moses, we've talked about David. How about um? The harlot. Uh, tell what is she doing in that lineage? I'd like to. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because she, the the New Testament writers aren't embarrassed by her, which if you think about it, that kind of should tell us something, that that they don't mind, they acknowledge that there's a harlot, that uh, Rahab who helped out uh, the Israelites, that that she is part of this story of salvation, which I think tells us so much about the whole point of the story of salvation is that God takes these flawed people and he uses them for our salvation. He used them to prepare for Jesus, and then he's still using them today. And I think the, the messiness of the Old Testament mm. uh, is somewhat of an indictment against how we want everything to be clean. And obviously, I like order. I like things set. And, th you know, you look at my bookshelf, it's very ordered back there and things like that. I get that. But there's a messiness of life. And the Old Testament's very messy. I mean, in, in the harlot, you know, Rahab is probably the most classic example of that. Uh, David and others we've already talked about. And I just feel like that is God telling us, I get it. I know you're fallen. Trust me, I know how bad off you are. But I'm not going to just reject you. I'm not going to just walk away from you. We talked at the beginning about my, my friends, the bar fight and stuff like that. And I'm still friends with him this day. We don't do much together anymore. We mostly keep up through Facebook or something like that. Because to me, it's very important. When you make a friend, you don't stop being friends with them if they go a different direction. Well said. You might have, mm -hmm. and in fact, being a friend with them might mean you tell them at times you're going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. But you don't stop being their friend. And I, I feel like that's a very important aspect of, of being a Catholic is you're loyal to your friends, to your family. And Jesus, in a sense, is loyal to his friends. I mean, look at the, the 12 apostles. He picks 12 guys. One of them completely uh, uh, betrays him. Another one denies him publicly. The, the leader denies him publicly. And so the messiness of salvation history, really, all, all from the harlot to David to, to Peter to Judas, everybody, there's just all these figures that are like us, frankly. And so I, I, I've always struggled with beating up myself when I don't do what I know is right. And there is, should be some contrition. There should be repentance, obviously. But I remember reading a book. Oh, what was it called? Like I think it was like how to, how to, uh, 
how to grow from your faults or something like that, how to find value in your faults, something like that. And it was very, it was very helpful for me because it, it did that balance saying, yes, when you have faults, you need to acknowledge them. You need to reckon them. Don't act like they're not faults. Don't act like they're not sins. But what you can do is you can really grow from them. You can mm-hmm. learn from them and say, hey, I can be actually, this fault helps remind me, first of all, humility. It gives me humility. I'm not God. I'm not in charge. I'm going to screw up. You put it in charge of me, in, in, with me in charge. And so I think those things, it's all part of the story that, that, that leads to us is that a lot of bad things have happened. And God just says that, you know, I, I'm going to forgive you if you ask for forgiveness, but I'm going to also work it out so it works out for your good in the end. Yeah, God is able to reap what he didn't sow if we fall in sin. But, what, you know, there's this, there's this thing you hear sometimes that just really uh, makes me angry. Oh, Catholic guilt. You know, what that is saying is that, yeah, we don't believe in sex outside of marriage. And, uh, you know, there's certain the moral stands that we take on abortion. And they talk about Catholic guilt. My mother wrote a little, a little letter to all of her grandchildren. <clears throat> this is just before she had a stroke where she could no longer write. So it's kind of a miracle she wrote this down. And it's to be read by the, each of their grandchildren on their birthdays each year. And in it, she talks about guilt. And she says, she says guilt has its place. And really what it is to bring conviction, you know. Uh, and then you repent. And then you go to reconciliation. And then you say to guilt, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. You've done your job. You can go now. But it's not Catholic guilt. Guilt's going to be there with you whether you whether you whatever you want to believe mentally about your morals there's a conscience that god's given you and you know when you've done wrong and you can lie about it enough to yourself where you're given over to a reprobate mind and you can mentally say you haven't done anything wrong but you have a fractured soul and your soul is broken and the beautiful thing about guilt when you're a catholic is the sacrament of reconciliation that it's it's for me you know Eric, it's like skydiving. You know, when you when you go when you when you when you're in in line to go to confession, I'm always nervous. Uh-huh. And then and oh, yeah. then yeah, and then and then it's like skydiving. You know, it, it it doesn't seem very real until they put the chute on your back. Then you're walking <laughs> into the plane, and now you're the fifth one to go. Uh, and it's there's a, there's a sort of a clammy feeling in your hands. You know, so there may be people that are listening that have not been to confession in quite a long time. Um, yeah, pack your chute. You know, do your, do your recollection and then go. Because once you jump out of that plane, anyone that I've ever jumped with, they, especially first-time jumpers, they feel after that once they jump, you can see fear in the camera when they're filming them. The minute they jump, there's just this release of joy on their face. And then uh, when they land, they feel they can conquer the world. That's the sacrament of reconciliation. When you go to confession, you confess your sins and you release. But I'll tell you something. When my one of my sons jumped for the first time, um, we were in the plane and I was going to jump. We were going to jump last so I could hang out with him at, at, during the free fall and after he opened his canopy. So we went through the jump zone and, and all of a sudden we were out of time. Ten people jumped. And so now there was two people that both attached to um, their jump masters. My son was with one and then another man who I didn't know. And so now we're circling for a full minute and a half or two minutes to get back to the jump zone. And during that time, this other gentleman lost his bowels. You know, it, the whole airplane was reeked. So my son, any apprehension he had, he was ready to jump. He jumped, and then I got to jump. And we got to hang out together on, in the sky. But that other guy wallowed in his misery right in his fear and so that's what sin is if it's unconfessed and um, we're so fortunate as Catholics that we can go to receive the sacrament of reconciliation that not only reconciles us to God but to our own integration of our soul and to the church which we're part of who's part of the body of Christ and the sacrament of reconciliation is so powerful when I was uh, growing up like I said I was Protestant and I, in high school at a retreat I went forward and accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior a pretty common thing for pro- evangelical Protestants like I was to do. This is like, I think, my sophomore year of high school. And so then for the next few years, I was an evangelical for about four or five more years before I became Catholic. Well, during that time, I remember in high school, I was a high school kid, so I did stupid things. I did things I shouldn't have done. And I knew they were wrong. I had that guilt. And so I'd go into my room, and I would kneel at my bed, and I'd ask God to forgive me. And and I think that's a legitimate good Yes. thing I did. Yeah. But at the same time, 
I remember I was thinking, did that work? Did God really forgive me? Did I do it right? Did I, did he, I, I didn't, cause I didn't hear anything. I don't, I mean, I was like, and so I would get scrupulous about, mm. and I tried, and I do it the next night. I'd say, God, you know, I am sorry for that. I really am. Mm. I was like, well, but did it count? Mm. And I still remember first time I went to confession it was before I was right before Easter, uh, 1993, I went to confession, went in there, laid it all out. It was in there for a long time because my whole life up to that point. And the priest saying, I forgive you of your sins in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And, and when I heard that to the ministry church, I forgive you your sins. I heard that. I was like, okay, now I know. I, I'm not guessing yeah. whether or not God forgave me. I know as a fact that he did forgive me. And so that, that, that release, I've never been skydiving, but I can imagine that release you talk about when you jump out. I mean, that's what it felt like. It's like, it's just this release. I was on cloud nine. Yes. And to this day, it's been 30 years almost, but this day, I'm the same. I, I'm still nervous in line. I still don't really want to go in, and I still walk out on cloud nine. And yes. it's not like you feel something like emotions, but sometimes you do. Yes. But other times, it, but it's, it always is that you just got a little bit of a lighter step when you're walking out because you're like, oh, yeah, this, this is it. And what I kind of like is I like those confessions that are very uh, – just very matter of fact, almost business like, where you just say them, priest says it, you know, gives you absolution, penance, you're out of there. The reason is because, like, think about the miracle that God did through that very, if anybody mm -hmm. heard that, which of course, hopefully they didn't, but it's just so matter of fact, business like, there's nothing to it yet. It's this beautiful miracle just happened. And so I almost like those better in a sense because I'm like, I can really see that yeah. we had nothing to do with this. this. The priest has nothing to do with this. I have nothing to do with this. This is all God. This is Amen. all a God thing. It's all his grace. Well, you know, we got to, we got to leave. Uh, but we purposely are in this show because it's uh, Christmas season. So I should say, uh, it's, we're recording it, but I should say Merry Kalika Maka to everybody. Merry Christmas to everybody. And also, if we had, we're going to have another uh, segment, a special segment of the show. After we're done uh, recording this, we're going to come right back and we're going to have Eric tell us about the sins that he's been confessing. <laughs> in the, <laughs> no, I guess you don't have time. All right. We got we to gotta go. Uh, I think Eric. we got a time limit on that one, buddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eric, thank you for joining us. Until next week, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. May the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell. Thank you.